In this video, I'll describe the basics of security analysis. I'll start by describing the top-down investing approach, and then in the remainder of the video, I'll introduce you to the concept of economic analysis, or as it's also known, macroeconomic analysis. And then finally, I will introduce you to some resources for collecting macroeconomic data. Now, when we talk about security analysis, what we're really talking about is the process of gathering information, organizing it into a logical framework, and then using that information to determine the intrinsic value of a common stock. And I know I've already mentioned an, the intrinsic value in this class, but just to refresh your memory, the intrinsic value is a measure of the underlying value of a share of stock. It's what that stock should be worth. Think of it as the fair value. And the intrinsic value of a stock is dependent upon really three different factors. First, we have the future cash flows of that stock. How much do you as a shareholder expect that stock to provide you in terms of income in the future? So what we're doing here is estimating your free cash flows in the next year, in the next year after that, in the third year, and so on and so forth, off, in, off into perpetuity. The next factor we need to take into account is the discount rate. And the discount rate is just this R here. It represents the amount by which we have to discount all of our free cash flows to the present because it costs money to actually borrow or receive capital to invest in order to receive these cash flows. So riskier securities will likely have a higher discount rate. And depending on the model we use to calculate the intrinsic value, the way we calculate this discount rate will change. And the final factor we need to take into account is, well, I guess I've already said it, it's the risk associated with the future cash flows and the discount rate. These free cash flows are not static. They will likely change. Our estimate of free cash flows that we have when we put together our intrinsic value are really just our, our best guess. They're probably, depending on the, the analyst, are going to be the, the mean free cash flow that we expect next year or the year after that or the year after that. And then the riskier the free cash flow, the greater we have to discount that cash flow. Now, there are really two ways in which we perform security analysis. In this video, I'll be describing the top-down approach. The top-down approach is pretty straightforward. We start with a very broad analysis of macroeconomic conditions, and that involves economic analysis. So what we're going to do is analyze the overall state of an economy and its potential effect on the businesses in that economy. If we determine that this economy that we're analyzing is going to be growing in the future and it's not going to have any detrimental effects on the businesses in that economy, then we move to the next level of analysis, industry analysis. And industry analysis is essentially analysis where we look at the overall outlook of a specific industry within which a, a firm operates. So most of what we're going to be doing with industry analysis is looking at the industry outlook. Is it possible for firms to remain profitable going forward? And can they remain competitive with one another going forward? Is it possible for any firm that we might invest in to actually maintain a profit margin that's fairly healthy? And if so, well, let's start looking at the securities in that industry. And that brings me to the final level of analysis, fundamental analysis. And fundamental analysis is analysis where we analyze the financial condition and the operating results of individual securities or companies in one industry. Now, this fundamental analysis or company analysis allows us to formulate expectations about a firm's future performance. So as you can see, what we're doing here with this top-down approach is drilling down. We start broad, and then if we like the economy, we look at industries in the economy, and then finally, if we like those industries, we look at specific firms in, those, in that industry that are in that economy. So that's the top-down approach. The other approach that investors sometimes use is called the bottom-up approach. And I'm not going to go into any great detail here 
with respect to the bottom-up approach, but basically what we do is we just try to identify which firms out there are the most highly undervalued. So it's it's essentially we're identifying undervalued securities and then investing in those securities regardless of the industry or the economy where those securities are traded or where the firms actually operate. Now, when we talk about economic analysis, what we're really talking about is the study of the underlying condition of the economy and the impact it might have on the behavior of share prices of firms in, the, in that economy. So what we're going for here, what we're trying to get a sense of, are the market-wide economic conditions. And what we're going to be doing is looking at fiscal data, monetary data, and then fiscal and monetary policies. And then we'll also try to get a sense of industrial production in that economy. Now, some macroeconomic variables are more important than others. Let's start with the most important, GDP, or gross domestic product. GDP is arguably the best metric we have with respect to macroeconomic analysis. It tells us how large the economy is, and what we're really more focused on is the change, or the, the percentage change in GDP. So if we click on this link, we should get some information from the IMF with respect to change in GDP. So here we are on the IMF's website, and as you can see, we can get a breakdown of the real GDP growth over the last year. And due to COVID, as you can see, most countries around the world have negative GDP growth. The US, uh, negative 5.9% GDP growth. Really the only countries that are growing were the countries that were hurt the least by COVID. I mean, China, they did a pretty good job of controlling it, even if you don't trust their data. Vietnam did exceptionally well other com countries like Ethiopia have been performing well for a very long time. South Sudan, their GDP was very low to begin with, uh, but most developed countries are seeing a significant decline in their GDP. Now, if we want to break this out and look at regions, we can actually see this over here on the right-hand side. Uh, so that's that. The next variable that we care about is consumer sentiment. Now, consumer sentiment is important because it tells us how bullish or bearish consumers are. So let's take a look at this. This is the best recommendation I have for collecting this data. It comes from either Bloomberg or the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank. So the University of Michigan puts out this consumer sentiment data and as you can see, consumer sentiment fluctuates depending on time period. Obviously, these gray areas are recessionary periods, which means two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And as you can see, consumer sentiment plunges around recessions. So here's the financial crisis of 2008 through 2010. And here we are now, and I will So this is where we are now. Obviously, consumer sentiment has fallen very far in the last several months, and it's unclear which direction that will head. If there's a resurgence of coronavirus and the moratorium on uh, people being kicked out of their homes is eliminated, you can expect this to fall farther. Now, the next macroeconomic variable we need to talk about is the unemployment rate. And obviously unemployment is important because it tells us who currently has a job, who does not have a job. And part of the reason that people are unemployed is maybe they're unemployable, maybe they don't have an, enough skills, but it might also indicate the amount of red tape in a country. For example, India is notorious for having a large amount of red tape, uh, which prevents companies from being allowed to expand across different regions in India. So let's take a look at unemployment rates. Here we are on the International Monetary Fund's website, and if we want to, we can select country group and look at countries, uh, our economic data for a group of countries. So let's try the G7. These are the most advanced countries on Earth. 
and we'll go ahead and continue. And we'll say that we want unemployment rate data. And click OK, prepare the report. And now we have data on unemployment for each of the G7 countries, including the US. Going forward from 2014 all the way to 2019. And then as you can see, these 2020 and 2021 numbers are in green, meaning that they are estimates. The next piece of macroeconomic information we need to understand is the inflation rate. So I've talked about inflation in this class, but it bears repeating again just how, how important inflation really is. I mean, in some countries, inflation is large enough that the value of the local currency can be eliminated in the span of, well, really a couple of years. I mean, if you look at hyperinflationary periods like the Weimar Republic in Germany or uh, the last couple decades in Zimbabwe. I mean, there's all kinds of cases throughout history of hyperinflation that tell us that inflation is very important. We don't want to invest in a country where there is a large amount of inflation because by the time we try to uh, extract our wealth, by the time we liquidate our in our share of a security in a country, the value of our investment converted back into US dollars will be lower because we have to exchange it at a worse exchange rate. So let's take a look at inflation. I've shown this chart in class before. This is just the personal consumption expenditures excluding the food and energy. This is our basic uh, inflation rate in the United States. And as you can see, this consumer price index is increasing through time, indicating that over time, with some really rare exceptions, inflation is positive and we don't have any deflation. Next, we care about interest rates. And interest rates are important because they tell us how much borrowers can borrow money for. I mean, they are the, the cost of doing business, the cost of money. So if, let's say, the, the base rate in an economy is very low, that incentivizes businesses to borrow from one from banks. If interest rates are very high, that means that the interest rate that our, any firm that we invest in can get in that economy will likely be pretty high and that will affect our bottom line and any uh, future cash flows that we receive. Now there's a lot of places that we can find information on those macroeconomic variables. I've listed three here. Let's take a look at one of these. So here is the macroeconomic calendar on Yahoo Finance. There's about a dozen other places where you can find the calendar of macroeconomic events. I'll show you how to do this in Bloomberg in a later video. Uh, but as you can see, what these macroeconomic calendars do is they give us the expectation provided by the market. So this might be coming from analysts. And then the actual number, once it's reported, is added here in this column. So here we have the number of housing starts, which was reported in uh, or on August 18th at 1230 PM for July. And as you can see, that number outperformed market expectations. Now you might be wondering, how quickly do investors respond to this macroeconomic information? And the answer is very quickly. I've mentioned high frequency traders in this class. Well, high frequency traders will often use a scraper program. Uh, sometimes this will be done using Python. There are other programs that, or computer programs that can scrape the internet as soon as this information becomes available. And their goal is to take that information analyze it, determine whether the number outperformed market expectations, and then trade on that information. All right, now let's take a look at some real GDP growth numbers produced by the IMF. And I'll talk you through what some of these numbers actually mean. So let's start with China. And the People's Republic of China you are undoubtedly aware has seen consistent rapid growth or very high GDP growth rates for the last really since Deng Xiaoping took over in the country. And 
As you can see, the GDP growth rate is extremely high through 2018. This would indicate that the economy is growing rapidly. Uh, this would benefit all the businesses in that economy, and this would generally indicate that maybe we should look at some specific industries in that economy. Meanwhile, Libya exists. <laughs> so I don't know how much you know about Libya's recent history, but they were one of the countries that got hit the hardest after the Arab Spring. Uh, so their, their former leader, Muammar Gaddafi, was felled in a coup, and that led to the Libyan Civil War. And in 2014, the real GDP growth rate was negative 47.7%. Not good. We would not want to be looking at at Libya if we're trying to invest. There's, uh, for a long time, there was civil war, uh, but maybe in 2016, we, we might have wanted to revisit that, uh, but this would make me as an investor very nervous. Next, let's take a look at Mongolia. And notice here that there's some extreme volatility, I mean, less so with, than with Libya, but with Mongolia, the country had a very high GDP growth rate. For several years prior to 2014, they actually had the highest GDP growth rate in the world. And part of that was due to a, a natural resources boom. So one of the biggest sectors or industries in Mongolia is the mining sector. And so they were producing a lot of raw materials for uh, China, which is just south of the country. Uh, the problem is that in 2015, 2016, 2017, the price of commodities fell, which led to a decline in GDP, uh, or rather a slowing of the GDP growth rate in Mongolia. So this would concern me as an investor, and once I looked at the the industry breakdown of Mongolia, I would find that a large portion of Mongolia's recent growth is due to the mining sector. Well, if there's a commodity slowdown, the other industries in Mongolia could be affected by a slowdown in the mining sector. And then finally, we have Venezuela. And Venezuela is kind of a train wreck, and it has been for a while. So the country is currently run by Maduro, who uh, he is essentially, he's a de facto dictator, and a large number of businesses and industries have seen nationalizations over the years in Venezuela. Uh, there's not a lot of freedom for investors. Uh, so Venezuela is one of those countries that you don't even need to do any industry analysis. This would be one country where I, I would not even waste my time looking at this, knowing the history of Venezuela. This is not a place where investors w would be uh, investing wisely. All right, now let's talk about the types of economic indicators that you see. The first are lagging indicators or lagging economic indicators. And these are indicators that change and indicate past economic performance. So a good example of this is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Uh, so it indicates how prices changed say, last quarter, for example. We also have coincident indicators, and these are indicators that move with the market as a whole, so contemporaneously. And an example of this might be GDP growth. Uh, so GDP growth is something that it's important, but it's not going to help you predict the future, as we saw in the last slide. So notice here that in some countries, we can see rapid GDP growth. Uh, GDP growth is really just, it, it gives us an indication of what's going on in the country either right now or in the past. The last type of economic indicators are easily the most important, and those are leading economic indicators. And these indicators tend to predict future economic conditions. And it's these indicators that we use to forecast returns in the broader market. So let's talk about some of these. What you're looking at is one of the best collections of leading economic indicators. This is the LEI, or the Leading Economic Index. It's an index of 10 different leading economic indicators that are lumped together to form one index. And that index is put together by the conference board. So let's talk about some of these indicators. All of these indicators give us some indication of future economic conditions. 
So for example, stock prices. Stock prices are determined by investors' expectations of future cash flows that they can derive from individual securities. So if stock prices rise, that indicates that investors are bullish on the future economic prospects of the uh, stocks that make up whatever index we're talking about. So in this case, it'd be the S&P 500 index. Uh, another good example of a leading economic indi indicator would be average weekly hours of manufacturing. So the manufacturing sector performs a large amount of analysis to determine the amount of goods that they can produce and sell. So if we see manufacturing ramping up and workers working more hours, that would be a good indicator that the manufacturing sector or firms in the manufacturing sector expect to sell a larger number of products in the immediate future. Another good indicator comes from the real estate industry. Uh, so building permits for new private housing units. Well, real estate developers are not going to start building houses without doing some analysis and determining whether there is a, a large demand for new private housing units. So if we see an increase in building permits, that's a pretty good indicator that at least the real estate sector at, or individuals or firms in the real estate sector expect increased disposable income. So those are just three examples, but we have 10 here to work with, but let's take a look at the LEI. So here we have the LEI, and you can look at it for any of these countries. So right now I'm on the US index, and here we have it. The conference board's LEI for the US increased 2%, in June to 102, following a 3.2% index in May and a 6.3% decrease in April. And we're given an explanation here. And if we wanted to, we could track this through time. Uh, we can also do this in Bloomberg. So I'm over on Bloomberg and I'm, I've typed in the ECST function, which I'll describe in more detail in another video. But for now, I just wanna show you where you can find the LEI on the, in Bloomberg. So if you type in ECST and then go down to leading indicators, you can actually look up the leading index or the leading economic index from the conference board and you can change the country here if you want. You can just click browse and do that. Uh, but let's actually take a look at the chart. So I'll just look at this. And as you can see, in the last year or so, we've seen some extreme volatility in terms of the LEI. If I go to the total LEI, what you can see is that it's been increasing for a while. And then recently, it fell off a cliff and it's rebounding. All right, now the final point I want to make with respect to economic indicators is that the US economic indicators are fairly reliable. The indicators of most developed countries will also be reliable. So you can more or less trust data on the UK, Germany, Australia, New Zealand. However, I need to say out loud that macroeconomic indicators outside the US are not calculated in the same manner or in many cases with the same accuracy as those in the US. Uh, this is why in most of those examples where I've shown you uh, international data, I've used the IMF or the World Bank. And it's because, quite frankly, these are two of our best, most reputable resources for collecting international macroeconomic indicators. If you use indicators produced by, let's say, the government of China or the government of some sub-Saharan African country, for example, those countries have a pretty poor track record of providing accurate data. I, I could give you all kinds of examples. In class, I probably will give you a number of examples, but suffice it to say, these data sources that you see, the World Bank and the IMF, are the two data sources that you should trust more so than any any other when you're dealing with uh, international data. All right, so let's recap what we covered.
First, security analysis is the process of collecting data to determine the intrinsic value of common stock. To perform security analysis, we first collect economic or macroeconomic data, and then we'll collect industry data, and then finally we'll collect firm data. And that process is called top-down analysis. We're identifying the good markets first, and then looking at good industries, and then finally selecting a good security to invest in. I also talked about leading economic indicators, and as I mentioned, leading economic indicators predict future economic conditions. They're the indicators that we want to focus on. And then finally, when you're collecting international data, always be cautious of the source, because if you're not using data from a reputable source, that data is almost as good as worthless. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out, and I will see you on the next video.